Glad you all are here this morning. Uh, would be nice if we were all in the mountains together, wouldn't it? That would be good to have, take us all up there one time. Anyway, glad you're here. My name's Dan Carter. If you haven't met me or know me, I was on staff here for three years and retired two years ago because that was my second retirement, and I'm trying to work towards my third one now. But anyway, glad that you're here. I, I'm privileged to come and share with you this morning from God's Word. It's a great blessing for me as I examine God's Word, let it examine me, and then I'm able to share with you some of the things that I've gleaned from it. So that's what we're going to do today, continuing this uh, series on heaven and looking at the idea, looking at the truth of living in the hope of heaven that is our great expectation, a sure anchor in the presence of God. So before I start looking at Philippians, and you can turn to Philippians if you'd like to, uh, we're going to be in chapter 1 primarily, but I want to read an, an excerpt. This is a little book that I use in the mornings. It's called the Lord, In the Lord I Take Refuge. It's by Dane Ortland. You may know him from writing a little book called Gently and Lowly. Anyway, that's a, that's a great book also. But this is just uh, the Psalms and a few thoughts from, from uh, Ortland on what he sees in that Psalm. And so these are some of the comments that he makes uh, from this 84th Psalm. And I want to read four verses over that Mike has just read and then read what he says about those. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And then in verse 10, he says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Norton says this, when God is your supreme value, your ultimate good, when you would rather have a lowly place with God than a comfortable place without Him, then no matter what pain washes into your life, your deepest joy cannot be threatened. You are safe. Nothing can touch you. Even the valleys of life become places of fruitfulness. But what if you do not sense God to be your greatest treasure? We all go through times like these, and that's why texts such as verse 11 are in the Bible, to recalibrate our hearts. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God is above you, illumining, a sun. God is before you, protecting, a shield. God is for you, dignifying. He bestows favor and honor. God is with you, lavishing. No good thing does he withhold. Great stuff, huh? Great stuff. So I want to try to unpack some of those thoughts using Philippians chapter 1 about this hope that really had seized David's heart, so much so that he would rather desert the kingdom and just be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in Jerusalem where there was still much wickedness, even though it was God's chosen people. But just think of that. I want you to think with me as, as I go into this sermon, some of the things that you've experienced in life, maybe one or two major events in which you found great joy and pleasure, something, you know, maybe it's a wedding. Maybe it's the birth of a child. Maybe it's a vacation land that you thought you would never see with your own eyes. Something significant in your life that gave you great joy, made your heart swell with gratitude, and maybe you still think on it from time to time as you go through life. Think about a place like that because we're going to be comparing the hope of heaven with the best that this world has to offer. Guess which one wins? Heaven. And the hope of heaven it's what fuels our life to live toward heaven now. It's what enables us to bring back the pleasures and the joy forevermore. They're at the right hand of God to bring those back. Even though they're in small order and small place sometimes, we bring those back from eternity and we distribute them around wherever we live. We live by hope in heaven. You know, you and I, the Bible is very clear on this. You and I were saved in hope of the redemption of these bodies. Do you ever think about that? Paul says, you know, we got a hope out there, and it's these bodies will be redempted, that the adoption that God has already provided, the justification and the redemption that he established through the blood of Jesus, those were all toward this eschatological reality that heaven is our home, this future hope. And so I remember in 1973 when I met Jesus, I was reading some books that were about the end times. And I remember going to bed reading those books. I was in college at the time. And so I'd do my studies, and I'd go to bed, I'd be reading this book, and, and as I'd go to sleep, I think, I'm probably going to wake up in heaven in the morning because I thought, man, Jesus is coming back now because that's what these authors were saying. And so I lived with an expectation that fueled my life. But, you know, sometimes I can get buried beneath all the concerns of life, can't it? We've got real responsibilities in life. 
We've got to pay bills. We've got to take care of spouses and children. We've got to take care of our parents sometimes. We've got to take care of the car and the house. All these different things that crowd in on us that are part of the American dream that becomes a nightmare when it begins to take all of our energy. And yet God says, in the midst of all of that, I want you to remember this, that it's better to be a doorkeeper in my house than to dwell in the tents of wickedness, to have all the wealth and the riches of this age. So we're going to read from Philippians chapter 1. And uh, before we do that, let's pray together. Father, we really, really welcome you here. We know that you are everywhere found, God, that there is no geography, no time, no space that you don't fill with the fullness of who you are. But God, we're asking just for the special sense, God, the palpable understanding of you dwelling among your people, within us, between us. And Father, as we read your word, as I preach your word, God, I pray that I might speak from compassion, that I might be candid, God, that I might bring clarity. And God, that I would be courageous to speak your word, God, that you might watch over it to perform it. So Holy Spirit, come. Be the instructor today. Speak to each of us. Speak to us together. Fling us out into the harvest, God, as we look to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I read these few verses, it's going to be uh, verses, I'm going to start with 12 in chapter 1 of Philippians and skip from 12 to 19. But I want to just share a few thoughts I had as I read Philippians. I, I've been reading the Bible for a long time, and uh, I've come to the conclusion, this is my opinion, that Philippians is Paul's most mature presentation of what a life of faith looks like. It's amazing when you read uh, what he's going through. He's in prison at the time he writes it, probably somewhere between 62 and 64 A.D., and about two years from now, 66 A.D., he's going to be martyred for his faith. And so he's writing under what you might call a little bit of duress, you know. He hasn't had friendly greetings. He's been, he's been thrown over walls and left for dead, beaten with rods, beaten with whips, shipwrecked, abandoned by friends. You know, and these things have happened over and over and over. But there's something that has stabilized him that has enabled him to overcome all those things and still get up each morning hopeful. And it's the reality that he's going to be joining Jesus soon. And so he writes from a very mature perspective. And he invites in this letter, which is interesting, it's a, it's a thank you note to the Christians at Philippi. He's writing to thank them because they've sponsored his ministry over the years. And in that, although we might think it would be inadvertent, he lays out the means and the way and what it looks like to live in faith in the hope that is in heaven for us at the right hand of God where Jesus dwells. Now, this is also interesting to think about. Jesus has raised us from the dead. That's what the Bible says. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive with Christ Jesus. He raised us up with him and seated us with heavenly places in him. Now, that's, a, that's an unusual thing. That's a very mysterious thing, isn't it? But it's truth that you and I have been raised up and seated in Christ Jesus. We draw our identity, our hope, we draw our vision for life from being in Christ Jesus. And Paul understood that well, and he understood it over a long period of time. His understanding was sharpened more and more. And so he even says here in Philippians, we'll look at this in a little bit, he has learned to be content in every circumstance. And remember, he's writing from prison. And he's the one that's saying, man, I'm full of joy. I want you to rejoice. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not bound. It's continuing to bear fruit everywhere that it goes. Even here among the prison guards, I'm seeing the kingdom of God spring up. And so he remains hopeful. Now, I don't know about you. I, I've only spent a little bit of time in jail. You, you may not spend any time in jail. But when I was in jail, I was not hopeful. In fact, I thought life had come crashing down around my ears, you know. And it had in a, in a very real sense. But that's what turned me to meet Jesus. And I became hopeful out of a very dark time in my life. But Paul has kind of gone the other direction. He's in jail. He's in prison. He's expecting to be put to death. He anticipates that he will die as a martyr. In fact, he told the elders at Ephesus when he headed back to Jerusalem, he said, you know, he said, I don't even consider my own life as precious to me, but only that I might fulfill the ministry that God has entrusted to me to preach the gospel of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And then he went on to Jerusalem knowing that chains awaited him, knowing that he would ultimately die for his faith in Christ Jesus, but hopeful the whole time, full of hope. It fueled him. It inflated him. It helped him get up every day and put his shoulder again towards the kingdom of God and to push forward. So it's a very mature letter. 
We're identifying with Christ, and he invites us in this letter to learn contentment. He invites us. This is what he says in chapter 3, before I read chapter 1. In chapter 3 and verse 17, he said, Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. He's calling us in this letter a thank you note. In the middle of that thank you note, he said, imitate my faith. Imitate the way that I behave in life because this is the way to have real hope. This is the way to gain the assurance of hope. And again, I say, he says, I've learned to be content in every circumstance. Now, there's no magic bullet in the Christian life. Y'all ever look for a magic bullet for faith? You know, a magic bullet that says, you know, if I go to that conference, if I learn this particular deal, if I memorize enough scripture, if I have some kind of experience, wow, I'm going to be on plexiglass floating through the difficulties of life. You're, yeah, maybe you never thought that way. Sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, there's got to be something out there. It's the next book. Yeah. Because you know, learning contentment, learning maturity is really like a crock pot, isn't it? We're being steeped in life over a long period of time, and Paul learned contentment. He learned to be content when he was in prison or when he was on the road, when he was enjoying a ride across the lake, when things were going smooth. But he learned contentment in every circumstance because he knew two things. Jesus was with him, and he had the hope of heaven. And you and I have that same hope. If we've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this hope. It may need to be stimulated. Oftentimes it does. And that's why Paul lays out in this letter ways that we can encourage that hope, ways that we can learn to live out of that hope in Christ. So, just, a, just kind of as a side note, you know, God does work miraculously sometimes. He heals bodies. He provides finances. He races to our need and instantaneously lifts us out of the mire. But most of life is like a crock pot. That's the way God works His will in us through the regular regimen, the routines of life, the trials and tribulations that we incur as we walk with Jesus. And so listen to this, verse 12 of chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And then skip to verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me is to live, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. This is a very interesting dilemma he's in, isn't it? Go home to be with Jesus, stay and help the saints grow. Go home to be with Jesus, stay and help the saints grow. And he's pulled between these. He would rather depart and be with Jesus. Isn't that something? He would rather depart and be with Jesus. But he knows that God has called him still to these people in Philippi and other churches to write them letters, to pray for them, to continue to exercise his spiritual energy and pour into them faith and hope through Christ Jesus. So I was thinking as I read that, I think about Martin Luther, who I, who I really I like to read after Martin Luther. He's very quotable. So one time he had uh, one of his supporters, a man who'd followed his ministry for years. Martin Luther was deep into the Reformation. Everything that he did had a cost with it. He was under papal bull that he'd be killed. Anytime you make him meet him on the road, you could kill Martin Luther and you wouldn't have any guilt incurred. So he was a man under much pressure for many years. So one of his followers came to him one day and said, Brother Martin, I'm praying for you that like Hezekiah, God would give you 15 more years. And Martin Luther looked at him and said, I don't want 15 more years. He was like Paul. He would rather depart. He had this great hope to finally see him face to face, the one who had died for him. He had this great hope. And he said, I'd rather depart and go be with Jesus. But he said, I'm going to stay. God's having me to stay to continue to help you, to encourage you in your faith. Now, it's a very interesting dilemma he found himself in, one that at points sometimes we may feel the same way, but maybe not for the same motivation. But there's that hope that's beyond us 
that's calling to us. And until we see Jesus face to face, we will never realize the full assurance of hope. And yet we have that hope because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And in Him is pleasure and joy forevermore. How many of y'all would like a little pleasure and joy forevermore? That sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? I mean, forevermore? I mean, you know, I went to Wonderland. It didn't last that long. Yeah. I mean, I even made Disney World. And it's still, you know, it's still, I, I lost the pleasure somewhere. I bought a new car and it smelled really good. And then my daughter spilled a big cup of milk in it and didn't tell me in the summer heats, heated it up. And my pleasure, my joy were gone. Little things that irritate. You got to remember, Paul is in prison. Not a nice jail. Not a lot of recreation to be had. No TV, no phone calls. If you had any food to eat, you likely got it from a friend that remembered you and brought it to you. And yet he's in this facility. He's under this trial. He's hopeful. He's glad that Jesus will be glorified in his life or in his death. And something else about that, basically in the third chapter he said, this is the normal Christian life in hope. This should be the norm for those who believe in Jesus. But you also have to remember, he learned this over many years through many trials. And if you and I are going to learn it, we're going to learn it through many trials. We're going to learn it slowly. We're going to learn contentment in Christ Jesus regardless of outer circumstances because of the hope that we have laid up in heaven where Jesus rules and reigns. So listen to these last few verses in chapter 1. Verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake." engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Have you, ever, have you ever had one of those breakfast box deals, you know, where you have a scripture and you pull it out, you know, and it says something really nice? You know, maybe like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you know. Have you ever pulled one out and it says, uh, man, I'm called to suffer for Jesus. It's been granted to us not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but to suffer for his sake to suffer the loss really of all things for the surpassing worth of what knowing Christ Jesus and the hope that he is to us now and what he has reserved for us in that day when we see him face to face when our bodies are redeemed and he embraces us with the fullness of grace for all eternity I don't know about you but I've had some I've had some really good experiences remember I told you to think about an experience that kind of lifted you up out of yourself made you grateful and joyful and you occasionally recall that to mind maybe on a regular basis i've had some great experiences but they do not hold a candle to what's going to occur when we see jesus face to face and by the power of his authority he will raise our bodies to newness and conform them to his own likeness that's what we were made for we were made to be like jesus with jesus one with the father by the Son, in the Holy Spirit. We were made for this. And Paul is writing to these people and saying, you know, this is what you need to have your mind set on. Those people who are heavenly minded, having this hope that gathers all their thoughts around it, those are the people that are really useful in the earth. I mean, really useful, right? I take, are there any politicians in here? You know, they're, they're really not that useful. I mean, I mean I, ex unless, unless, unless they understand the hope of Jesus and take that into their decision-making power, unless they take that into their relationships. How about a successful business? Jeff Bezos is pretty successful. You remember when a million was a lot of money? You remember when a billion was a lot of money? Pretty soon we're going to be remembering when a trillion was a lot of money, aren't we? So here's Jeff Bezos. I don't know what he's worth today. It depends. It's $140, $150 billion dollars. It's going to be hard for him to spend that next Friday. $150 billion. But he's not worth as much as one person walking in the streets of 
San Jacinto with hope in their heart and sharing the goodness and the love of God with one individual that comes to faith in Christ Jesus because of the testimony of the hope of heaven that's found in Jesus. Yeah. So people that are really heavenly minded, that's us. We're the people of God. Those who are heavenly minded have eternal impact. Isn't that amazing? That's wonderful. So Paul tells us as he goes through this letter, how can I live in a way to imitate him? This guy's full of hope in a bad situation. He's rejoicing. He's the one telling the people on the outside of the prison to rejoice. How did he come to this? How did he learn this contentment? How did he get so hopeful that he rejoices that the gospel is proclaimed even by people that are just trying to hurt him by the proclamation of it for the wrong reason? How did he get there? He shares some things in this, this letter. So I wanted to relate some of those to you. It starts with this, acknowledge Jesus as Lord, because heaven, let me tell you something about heaven. Heaven is by invitation only. Nobody's going nobody's to break in the gates of heaven and say, hey, I'm going to crash the party. No, you're invited. Fortunately, all the world has been given this invitation. And Paul said that that time had gone out through all the world, that everywhere the gospel has gone, people have responded. And so our responsibility, God gives the invitation, we have a, an RSV to return. Repond, respondent, s'il vous plaît. Which in French means respond if it pleases you. Does the gospel please you? Does the gospel that Jesus who loved you died in your place? rose again on the third day, went to the right hand of the Father and prays and intercedes representing you now, today, so that you are secure, that your hope in Him will be fruitful, that you will see Him face to face. Does that please you? Then the RSVP is this, Jesus, you are Lord. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Not one will be ashamed of their hope. This is where Paul started. He started when he got knocked off a donkey and blinded by Jesus on a roadside. And he said, Lord, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. And Paul's acknowledgement of Jesus from a life of pursuing and persecuting the church to one who declared Jesus as Lord went from despair, went from anger to one of hope and peace and put him on a road that led to great contentment. And it's the same for us. He says this in several places, but he says to Euodia and Sintiche, I, I looked this up, how do you say this lady's name, chapter 4? Nobody knows, but they play like they do. <laughs> so one guy says, well, it's Sintish. No, it's Sintike. No, it's Sintiki. No, we don't know. We know, though, that Euodia and Sintishes were two ladies who taught and had authority in this church somehow. And they weren't getting along well. Can you imagine the church people not getting along well? I mean, really, come on. They weren't getting along well. Paul says not only to them, but he says in other places, he says, strive for the unity of presenting the gospel wherever you go and whatever you're about. Don't grumble, don't complain about the things that are set on your plate and agree together that you're here for something much greater than yourself. If we're going to be people who are hopeful, we've got to buy into community. If we want our hope to grow, we've got to buy into community. We begin to see people changed before our eyes. In fact, we begin to change. And we're going, wow, this gospel is great. It's changing my heart. It's changing that person's heart. But you have to live in community to see that for that hope to grow. So the other day I was driving a, a gentleman, a lawyer from, from Street Toyota, where I drive a shuttle car, back to his office. And I could tell that he had some, some faith because he greeted a lady in the, in the area of the service department with, God bless you. And so I got in the car with him and said, hey, where do you go to church? He said, oh, I don't go anymore. I said, why not? He said, we used to have a house, in our, excuse me, a house church, but he said, COVID just kind of broke that apart, and we haven't found any place that, that really matches our expectations. And I'm going, so I told that to a friend of mine, and he said, well, he didn't look very hard, did he? You know, there's always going to be problems in churches, aren't there? But if we don't buy into community, we will never see the great working of God that will cause hope to grow deeper and broader and wider in us. 
So I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're all here. You're coming to church. But there's going to come a day when you're tempted to say, eh, I don't think I want to go today. Don't listen to that voice. That's not God's voice. That's not the voice of hope. That's the voice of cynicism. Hope and cynicism don't grow well together. And if we're cynical about the state of the church, then we need to bring our hope and our love and our service into that group. We need to be the mature one. We need to be the adult. We need to grow up. And so Paul tells us, live in community. And he says, while you're in that community, serve others. One of the things I like to do, one of the gifts God's given me is to, is to study and to teach and to preach the Word of God. And I love to do it. And I've got some passion about it. It moves me more deeply than anything else I do. You have gifts. You have a calling. You have a vocation in the church. It may not be preaching. It might be showing mercy. It might be administrating. It might be some, something else. Paul lists a bunch of them, and it's not an exhaustive list. But he says, serve others. Jesus served. In fact, he served so greatly that he deserted heaven for our sake, and he served all the way to death. That's how he got his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. His Father promoted him to a position of all authority in heaven and on earth, and every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because he served. And he learned obedience through his service. And you and I will learn the same thing. And as our obedience grows, our hope grows. And so we continue to serve. And Paul says, serve in the community and your hope will grow. Then he says this, in chapter 3, he speaks about traveling light. America doesn't travel very light, do they? If you go down I-27 towards Canyon, there's about a 640-acre patch of new storage buildings. Have you seen that one? It's down there by the... Yeah, I can't remember what street it's on. can't remember what road it's across. McCormick, maybe. Anyway, it's like, what happened to their garage? You know what happened to their garage? Their garage, they can't get in their garage anymore. They can't even walk into it because they pack stuff in there so tightly. And they know they've got good stuff in there, but they don't know where it's at. And so now they buy a storage building or a few storage, and they stuff it in there. And then they have to be concerned about, what did I do with that? Where is it? Paul says, whatever gain I've had, I count it as loss. I've let it go. Whether it was good or whether it was bad in my estimation, it's gone behind me. I'm throwing it behind me. God calls us to travel light. Because when we don't travel light, anxiety is attached to us like barnacles on a ship. It slows down our pursuit of hope and faith to have a lot of stuff that we have to govern and pay for and clean and wonder where it's at. Travel light. Give it away. Jesus gave himself away. He's the prototypical light traveler. Amazing. No place to lay his head. But he did all right. He seemed to do okay. He got us into the kingdom traveling light. Probably the same thing will happen for us. So listen to how Paul says this. Verse 7 of chapter 3. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Remember, we're called to suffer. One of the big things we suffer is the loss of everything as a priority above Jesus. We lose that to Him. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Talk about a heavy weight trying to make a righteousness of your own. He said, I want to get rid of every stitch every piece of fabric that would seem to be my own building towards righteousness. But I want to know that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He's doing this in prison. Sometimes we think, well, circumstances get a little better. I'll devote a little more energy, more time, more money, more talent to God. No, that's not the way it works. You give yourself to God where you are with what you've got. Not everybody has the same thing, do they? They're not in the same position, but everyone is called to give all. This is our RSVP. Jesus, you are Lord. I'm not. You are Lord, Jesus. And as we begin to yield to Him, we find out that He is more than enough to content us. He is full of pleasure and joys forevermore that he delights to share with us so 45 years ago a man named keith green wrote a song about 
not waiting to get to heaven. She said, I can't wait to get to heaven where you wipe away all my tears. For six days you created everything, but you've been working on heaven. Yes, you've been working on heaven 2,000 years. 2,000 years Jesus has been building heaven. took him six days to make the Rockies, the Pacific Ocean, Antarctica, and the Arctic. Put the poles in position to tilt it at 23 and a half degrees to the sun that he'd already created to spin it off where it rotates at just the right speed for just the right amount of time so that we enjoy four seasons. Plus all the stuff beyond our solar system. Took him six days. For 2,000 years, he's been building a place for us to come. And while he's doing that, his joy is so much taken up in us that he has decided not to sit at table with wine until we join him in that new kingdom and feast at the banquet of God for all eternity. So Keith Green said, you know, if it took him six days to build everything that I can see and things that I cannot, and he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years, he said, this place is a garbage heap compared to what he's preparing for us. This is the hope that you and I have, a hope that will sturdy us and anchor us through all the vicissitudes, all the difficulties, all the suffering that we might incur in life is not worth comparing to this hope, the hope of heaven and the presence of God for which we were made and which is being made for us. Wow. What a great gospel. What a great Jesus. What a great hope. And so he says, travel light, drop things. And then he says this, pray with gratitude and thanksgiving. He says, let your requests be made known to God, and he will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Pray with gratitude. Let the Lord know your request. You can do all things through God who strengthens you. That doesn't mean you can go out and win the NBA championship or that you can become seven foot five and become the best center the NBA has ever known. It doesn't have anything to do with that kind of junk. What it has to do with is you can do everything that God has assigned and put on your plate. I can do what God has assigned and put on my plate because I can do all that he's assigned me according to the strength that he gives in Christ Jesus in expectation of the hope that is to be revealed to us on that day. So I read this quote. I'll just share it with you. It's pithy, easy to remember. The pursuit of God is the pursuit of pleasure. Wow, that's good. The pursuit of God is the pursuit of pleasure. What's your hope in? What are you pursuing? I heard a pastor one time of a huge church, a mega church, 25,000 members in one congregational setting. And he had an elder that had kind of drifted away. He'd gotten busy in his business. And so he took him aside. This had gone on for several months and up to a year. And he said, hey, what's going on with you, man? You used to be so bought in. You were here to minister. You were doing things in the community. You were involved in all the decision-making in the church. You were praying with us in leadership. He said, what's going on? He said, oh, my business has just really taken off. Now, I've got to I've got to tend to these things. I've got to take care of this issue and that issue. And he says, well, let me ask you a question. When is enough enough? When is enough enough? Enough is enough when Jesus is what we're pursuing. That's enough. The pursuit of pleasure is the pursuit of God. What are you pursuing? Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you, God. Thank you that you pursued us. You pursued us all the way from glory, from the majesty that you enjoyed with the Father and the Spirit from all eternity past. You pursued us out of that place to bring us back home. You gave up your life. You died in our place. You paid our debt. You redeemed us. You adopted us. You justified us, all these great words, because you loved us, to bring us back home. So, Father, help us. We bring our hearts to you. We pray you'd help us to lodge our hope in you. That we do these simple things that Paul was doing, that he had learned contentment in, God, giving himself away. Help us to be givers, God. Help us. We need more grace. You've got it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.